Hey, what's going on, Arsenal family? Today, we are wrapping up our series of talks on the story of a man in the Bible named Gideon. And it's a pretty cool story. If you've missed what we've led up to the last few weeks, let me catch you up uh, by giving you a really horrible recap. Things were going really bad in Israel. God came to Gideon and said, hey, I'm gonna use you to deliver Israel from these bad people called the Midianites that were coming in and stealing everybody's food. And he asked Gideon to do a lot of things that don't really make a lot of sense to people. And Gideon said, why are you making me do these things that don't make a lot of sense? And God says, so that you'll know it was me who delivered you, so that you'll remember me, so that you won't stray away, so that you won't forget God, you won't forget me. And then God did what he said. He saved Israel from these people who were coming in and oppressing them. And so that's kind of where we pick up this story right now. So God really was at this place where he said, hey, I'm gonna do these things very differently because I don't want you to forget me. Guess what the people of Israel did? They, they forgot God, all right? They, they, they forgot what he told them to do, they forgot. And a lot of times we look at stories like this and it's kind of like, man, like what's wrong with these people? But as I was reading through this story, I, it really hit me hard that I, I kind of do the same thing. You know what I'm saying? Like when life is really good for me, I'm, I'm not spending as much time like in dedicated prayer or in the Bible. But man, when those struggles hit, when something happens that hurts or something happens that's scary, you know what happens is, man, my prayer life, I'm just killing it. You know? Do you, re do you relate to that? Like I'm, I'm waking up in the morning and I'm hitting that Bible reading plan on my app. Like that's just kind of a sort of natural flow of things that when things are not going well, we really go, oh God, God, God. And then when things get really good, it's very easy to forget the goodness and the love that God has for us. And this even applies to me. I don't, I don't know how you are, but maybe these are unhealthy things, but it kind of applies to my life in general. Like when I get really stressed out or really mad, my house is about to get cleaned. Some of you maybe relate to this. Like, I mean, if I'm really mad, the dishes are gonna get done, the laundry's gonna get done, all the sheets are coming off, all the beds, I'm mopping, I'm vacuuming, the windows are getting clean, the window sills are getting wiped down, the baseboards are getting wiped down, the ceiling fans are getting dusted, like it's all getting clean. So if you ever come over to my house, I got four kids, if you ever come over to my house and everything is clean, I need you to be a good friend and be like, Rob, what's wrong? You know what I'm saying? Like. In our, in, our, in our fear when things are going bad, when we're really stressed out, when we're really angry, those are the times where we do, I don't know, things that probably need to be done anyway. Pray, spend time with God, read the Bible. And this seems to be kind of the story with the nation of Israel as we read through the Old Testament. We, we see them kind of go up and down a lot. We kind of see them go into relationship with God and out of relationship with God. When life is really good, they're like, hey guys, let's, let's worship some idols. And then when everything gets really horrible, they go, God, where are you? And they kind of like cry out to God, you know, like, and, and it puts us in this like cycle. I think people, across the board can relate to this sort of cycle of things getting good and our, our habits sort of change. I want you to know this today though, Jesus has provided a way out of that cycle of things being good and things being bad. We're not into relationship with God and out of relationship with God. It's not like God is happy with us sometimes and mad at us other times. Sometimes we're at peace with God and other times we're not, no. Through the cross, Jesus has established peace with man once and for all. God has, is not mad at us. God is, God is happy with us. He's pleased with us. We are new creations in him, and he has made peace with man. And we are dependent on that finished work of Jesus. 
Gideon and Israel, they lived under this different covenant. What they were dependent on is their ability to obey. So it really makes sense for them that they were kind of doing well sometimes and not other times because across the board, every person of all time, man, sometimes we do well and sometimes we don't. In this story, where we're at right now, you can, you can even catch up on YouTube. We have, we have a few messages on the story of Gideon, Gideon leading up, or you can find the story in Judges chapters 6, 7, 8. There's a lot of cool stuff that actually we didn't cover in this series. There's a lot of awesome details. Um, but where we're at in the story right now, something very significant happens. Because it, it seems like we maybe should have reached the end of the story, like everything was really bad, God rose up Gideon, and then he, he defeated the Midianites. Something very significant happens right now at this point in the story, because if you've paid attention to the story or if you're familiar with the story, you know there was a lot of communication between God and Gideon. In fact, the story starts with an angel coming to Gideon and going, oh, mighty man of valor, as Gideon was actually hiding from his enemies. And Gideon talks to the angel and Gideon talks to God and God talks to Gideon. There's a lot of communication that goes on throughout this whole story. As soon as God defeats the enemy, the communication stops. As soon as Israel gets what they want from God, no longer in the story at all do we hear, and they said to God, or and God said to them, the communication completely stops. And then to understand kind of what happens next, we need to understand a little bit of historical context. See, when Israel, this nation, was established, God set it up in a different way because the way you set up a kingdom back then was with a king. You put a king in place and generally what they would do is they would raise up armies, they would become strong so that they could expand their kingdom and that involved defeating the other kingdoms. The, the whole point of raising up a kingdom was to defeat the other kingdoms and expand your kingdom and unite the world under one kingdom. When God established the nation of Israel, he told them, we're not doing it that way. We're going to do something different. God said to Israel through Moses, I will be your king. Your king's not a man. Your king is God himself. There will be people in each town, and we're going to call them judges, and they're just going to be there to make sure everybody's doing the right thing. Make sure everybody's not going out of control, hurting people. They're there for justice. And God said, I will be the king that unites you. And this was the nation of Israel as God established it. So other kingdoms were there trying to expand and trying to overtake other nations. And God goes, we're going to do things. We're going to do these things a little bit different. So this is important to know in the story of Gideon because something happens in this story. Again, God had just delivered them from a nation that was coming against them. And God had set them up to live with these judges and he would be their king. And then watch what happens in this story when Gideon is the leader of the army that God used. Judges 8, 22 and 23. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, rule over us. You and your son and your grandson also, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. This is so huge because remember, God said, I will be your king. And what did he tell him at the very beginning when Gideon said, God, why are we doing all of these crazy things? God said, because I want you to remember me. I want you to know that I delivered you. And still, still the people of Israel say, Gideon, you saved us. 
be our king. This is so significant because the people, what they're doing here is they are rejecting God as their king, even though it was clearly him who saved them. This actually wasn't the last time. This was a constant struggle for the people of Israel because we we can have a little bit of grace for them because this idea of God as a king and having judges, nobody else did it this way. It it wasn't a known thing. It wasn't a common thing. It wasn't like, hey, you can either do judges or kings or presidents or, you know, dictatorship. It wasn't like pick one of those. No, no, no. You had a king. That's how you had a nation. Nations were established with kings. So the people of Israel, when God said, hey, we're going to have judges and I will be your king, They often forgot, they often said, hey, we want to be like those guys. Look at those other nations that have kings, forgetting that God was their king. They actually at one point said, give us a king that we may be like other nations. They were God's chosen people and they said, no, 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 we want to be like them. And it came to a head it finally came to a point where God said, okay, you'll you'll have your king. But they received a warning. God set up this nation of judges. And in 1 Samuel chapter 8 is where it all comes down. Samuel was the last of the judges. And the people came to Samuel, Samuel and they said, we want you to appoint a king that we may be like other nations. And listen to Samuel's response. When the people of Israel were saying, we want a king, we don't want to do things God's way, we're not recognizing God as our king, even though he's the one that established our nation. And he's the one that delivered us. He's the one that freed us. He's the one that saved us. We are rejecting him as our king. And Samuel gives them a warning. 1 Samuel 8, 10 through 18, it says, So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and your female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys, not the donkeys, and he will put them to work. He will take the tenth of your flocks, and you shall be his slaves. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. Man, I don't know about you, but you you threaten my kids. Like, I'm, I'm... I'm going like, hey guys, let's let's talk about this king thing a minute. What did the people of Israel do? They go, yeah, that sounds good. We want a king. See, when everything was going well, they forgot the reliability of the word of God. They forgot the reliability of of the promise of God. And I want you to know this today, just because we don't feel God, just because we don't feel our need for him doesn't mean we don't need him. Just because we don't feel like we're in the fight of our lives doesn't mean that God has taken a break from meaningful relationship with us. See, God is just as available and just as present when things are going well as when they're not. We just recognize our need for him more. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about how God is with us 
in the storm. How God is with us in the valley. How God is with us in the hardest times of our lives. But the truth is we tend to really forget him more often when things are going well. Like on the mountaintop, in the peaceful seas. Because we don't feel in those moments like we need him. Now let me slow down just just a minute here. Because what I'm saying right now might feel like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to pile like some guilt on you. Like, hey, feel bad. If, if you're doing really good, feel bad. That's not what I'm saying at all. Because when this starts feeling like guilt, really what we're doing is this very unhealthy thing. What we're doing is creating a false crisis, which is just a way to put ourselves back into an unhealthy place so that we can experience God from down here so that we can put ourselves back into a valley, back into a storm, back into an unhealthy place and go, oh God, help us, save us. And we've still not learned how to recognize God and his grace and his goodness when we're standing up on the mountaintop, when things are going well, when the seas are calm, we've just created more turmoil to put us back in that healthy place. And we don't have to do that. What if, what if we didn't do that? What if instead we could simply live in the peace and the thankfulness of knowing that God cares for us even when things are going well? How, can we get there? You know, when I was younger, way back before I had kids, I got to travel a lot. I did a lot of traveling. I've been around the world. I got to travel around the United States. I've, I've been to a lot of different places. Now my children are my adventure. Um, But one time I got to go uh, to Switzerland. And in Switzerland, I got to go up on the Swiss Alps, uh, like ride the gondola to the top. But at the bottom of the Alps, you kind of look up at these massive mountains. I mean, they're just beautiful. One of the most beautiful places in the world. You kind of look up and the hills are alive with the sound of music. It's just beautiful. The Swiss Alps, you look up, and then I got on this gondola and and rode it to the top. It wasn't like one of those big ones where you get like a bunch of people in there. Like I was by myself in this little car, like on on a cable, you know, this little cable car riding up the Swiss Alps. It was amazing just looking around and seeing this like God's creation. But I saw it from the bottom looking up and it was just amazing. And what's cool about this is is a lot of times you'll see this mountain going up and you're standing there and there's clouds that kind of cut off the top. The clouds cut off the top of the mountain and I'm riding this gondola up through the clouds and you come up above it and up at the top there was was a restaurant up there and so I had some schnitzel on the Swiss Alps. Um, That was kind of cool. I paid way too much money for it. But I get up to the top and they have these sort of observation areas where they had like a cross up on the, on the peak and you go up there. And what was cool is I got up on the top and I'm looking around. It's like the tallest thing around. You can see like some other peaks that are peeking up through the clouds. And it was kind of windy that day. So the clouds were moving. And I remember standing on top of this mountain and there's a group of people, we're all standing on the top, the peak of this mountain. And I see this big cloud and it's moving toward us. And I see it and it's way, I mean, it's, it's probably hundreds of feet below us. It, we're looking down at the cloud and it's moving at us. And I'm thinking like, it's about to hit the mountain. Like what's, and I remember thinking, what is the cloud going to do when it hits the mountain? Is it going to Like, there's nowhere for it to really go around. It's going to run into another mountain over there. Like, is it going to, is it going to dissipate? And it totally, like, blew my mind. When that cloud came and it hit the mountain, it started climbing up toward me. The cloud climbed up the side of the mountain toward me. And I watched it, and it came, and it swept over me, and I was in the cloud, And then I watched it go down the other side of the mountain. And it just blew my mind. I had a completely different perspective 
of this mountain, of the clouds, of the way everything worked. You see, I had seen pictures of mountains from the bottom. And maybe even pictures kind of from the top. But I'd never seen it in action like that. This cloud sweeping over. I'd seen it from the valley and I'd seen it from the top. And when we get this idea, when we begin to understand that most of the time when we've been looking at God, we've been looking at him from the foot of the mountain saying, oh God, help me. We've not seen yet his glory and his majesty from the top of the mountain. See, we have to accept this grace and forgiveness and humility in our worst moments. It's, I mean, it's our only choice. What else are we going to do? Who else is going to answer us when we feel like we're at the bottom? God does every time. It's when we feel like we're at the top, when we're doing things right, when performance-wise we're just out there killing it, that we tend to forget the grace that we've received. And let me tell you the very moment that we tend to forget It's the moment that we start to compare ourselves with others. It's the moment that we go, man, look at my performance. Ah, it's better than theirs. That is the moment that we forgot the grace that we live in. Romans 5.1 says this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It goes on to say we stand in grace. We stand in this grace. This is where we live by faith. See, grace is not just this thing that we get little by little when we need it. It is the place that we live. It is our new spiritual location. So instead of waiting for a crisis to remind us where we live, what we've received, I think what we need to do is establish some new reminders. Something that says not only, hey, here's something you need, but hey, here's where you live. Here's what Jesus has done. You live in grace, whether you're doing well or you're doing poor. What if we remember that every breath is by grace. What if we remembered every gift that we receive is by grace? What if we remembered in every moment that for us and for everybody else, that grace is never, ever earned, but freely given to us by God? See, that is the mountaintop where we not only see the grace and the love that God has for us, but we can see the fullness of his grace and his love for the entire world. That is transformation. That is beginning to get a glimpse of the greatness of God. See, it's real easy to look at people and go, man, they're doing it wrong. I mean, think about the world we live in right now. You can think about a group of people who are doing it wrong. What if instead of looking at them and beginning to compare and beginning to point out the flaws, what if we looked at them and said, man, God's grace, we look at God and say his grace, his goodness, his fullness is so good that it's even for them. See, when we say it's not for them, we're not attacking them. We're attacking him. We're not saying they're not good enough. We're saying his grace is not good enough. Instead, let's come to this realization that God's love is bigger and better than anything that we could come up with ourselves. 
And this is relationship with God that he will constantly reveal more and more and more to you. And sometimes the way he does that is by allowing you to see the struggles of other people. And he says, yep, it's good enough for them. Yep, it is enough for them too. And we have these questions like, even these guys, God, yes. Because it's not by performance, it's not by works, it's by God's love and his grace for humankind. His love is bigger, his love is better. Arsenal family, this is the way that we're designed to live. Not like the Israelites who were constantly in and out of relationship with God. They were up and they were down. God was blessing them and he was pulling out that blessing because they were worshiping other gods. All we have to do is remember that his love is full for us. See, it's, it, it's not that we come out of his blessings. It's that we believe the lie that we're not in his blessings. We believe the lie that because we've done something, God is pulling back from us or that God is mad at us. And that is an outright horrible lie. God's no longer holding sin against us. God loves us deeply. God's not mad at us. We're not in and out. We're not up and down. We are secure in Christ because of the finished work of the cross. We are experiencing his love more and more each day on our bad days and in our good days. And that has everything to do with who he is. I want you to know this today that God is good on his promises that God's grace is for all, that God's love is for all. So let me tell you this, when you're struggling looking at the world around you, let it be a reminder of how big and how great and how loving God is. I can't believe I get to say this right now, but Arsenal family, I will see you in person next week. I love you so much and I can't wait. Arsenal family, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. I really hope you appreciated that as much as I did. Hey, quick plug real quick. If you haven't yet, definitely be on the lookout for Arsenal merch dropping really soon. I know a we all want to get swagged out and stay warm for the winter. So definitely be on the lookout for that. And hey, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe on YouTube, like this video, again, share, get it out to those who maybe uh, have been watched, maybe haven't even heard of the Arsenal, um, but that you really feel can benefit from what's going on here at the Arsenal. And uh, hey, with that being said, maybe check out one of these videos and we'll see you next week, February 7th. Don't forget, in person.